The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Oh, hell no! Whatever! The following program contains opinions expressed by The Dead Zone. If you find this broadcast offensive, <laughs> lighten up, candy ass. What? Oh my gosh. It's a radio show. Hell yeah! That's what I'm talking about. Power up request received. Initiating systems. Powering up transmitters. Welcome to the dead zone. March 13th, Dead Zone Paranormal Radio Show. Welcome back. Tonight we're going to have Joseph Stewart, author of Demons, A Secular Look. The man's been in the field for over 50 years, so uh, you're going to enjoy this one. And we're going to have Michelle with the Paranormal News. But we're going to kick it off. We're going to kick it off. We're going to kick tonight off with The Weight by Pentogram. Check it out. Are you in a band or know of a band that is currently unsigned and looking for airplay for free? We want to hear from you. One of the main goals of the show is to help promote up-and-coming bands and artists as well as our paranormal community. Getting your name out there can be tough, especially these days. Shoot us an email, deadzonebooking at gmail.com. If your music fits our genre, hard rock, 80s, 90s metal, and new metal, we want to help.
This is Rick McCullum of the Hollywood Ghost Hunters, and you're listening to The Dead Zone. Dead Zone WDZRDB Worldwide. David Walton. I am a vocal performer for What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show, and I have carried the burden of a terrible secret. I am actually what is offensively called a ghost. For years now, I have concealed my ectoplasmic existence from my friends and family, in fear of a common prejudice against ghosts, or what we like to call the disembodied. I have existed frightened of being discovered, unable to do physical acts that the embodied take for granted, such as walking a squirrel, or drinking a glass of vitamin E milk fresh squeezed from a whale. I grew depressed 
and even considered acts of self-harm or reincarnation, which is suicide for the disembodied. Such movies as Ghostbusters and its sequels drove my feelings of disenfranchisement and I began looking for help, only to encounter painful exorcisms in the houses I haunted. Then, I met two good people, it says here, Fox and Phil, at What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal. And they helped me take control of my own life. Now, it is my choice whether I wish to make phantom bangs in the night, appear at the foot of your bed in darkness, or make your walls bleed. If you are a disembodied person like I am, and you're living a lie, what are you afraid of can help you too. They are on at 9pm on Friday nights at Para X Radio, leaving plenty of time for midnight haunting activities, and can be found on all major podcast services. Listen to their paranormal stories, interviews, humorous sketches and horror fiction, to know that you are not alone. And if you are a member of the Embodied, don't forget, you are only a single heart attack or tumour away from becoming one of us. This is David Walton. See you on the other side. Or as I call it, this side. And that is the end of a perfect day. Paranormal news. Hello, this is Michelle with Paranormal News. On ReikiInfiniteHealer.com, there's an article about the six most common sources of emotional damage. I'm going, I'm not going to read the whole article about it. I'm just going to read uh, some of it here, which is going to be a lead-in to what I want to talk about. So the first one that he has listed is neglect or rejection. Neglect or rejection is commonly experienced in our childhood, and if we never address it, the pain will never heal. It's a sad fact that this is probably the number one thing that prevents people from healing. Common examples include neglectful or abusive parents who failed to care or nurture one's emotional spirit. Other situations include broken friendships. When a relationship breaks up or even a co-worker or acquaintance seems to be avoiding your presence. These experiences may cause us to lash out in anger or hold that negative emotion in certain chakras or deep within our energetic field. Most typically, emotional damage from rejection is held in the heart and solar plexus chakra. The next one he talks about is loss and dramatic stress. Stress is a natural emotion that results when you lose something important to you. Someone that you cared for passes away or you suffer a traumatic experience like rejection. This kind of trauma is extremely difficult to overcome, but it can be done. The experience of loss can shatter one's assumptions about the world and force us to retreat inwardly. Chakras begin to close up and become warped and our aura begins to change to a darkish gray color. The next one is guilt and shame. Rejection, loneliness, and loss are painful experiences caused in part by our need for strong connection with others. However, in guilt, you are the source of your own unhappiness. This can be a tough pill to swallow but the majority of all guilt and shame starts from the self. Guilt comes as a form of misalignment from one's moral compass or direction and is commonly experienced in two ways. Unresolved guilt refers to the feelings left behind when you believe you may not have completely apologized for a wrong you committed against another person, even though in reality you did all that you could. So to overcome guilt, you must forgive yourself first. After you've forgiven yourself, you need to feel that it's okay for you to re-engage with your life and go on to enjoy that success you feel so guilty about. 
Next, we have living in the past. Going over and over the unpleasant or disappointing experiences in your life, whether real or imagined, takes its toll on your well-being. Just like a scar that you pick at over and over again, it will leave a permanent mark unless you learn how to stop. The first step to start living in the present is to realize that other people don't see the world the same way that you do. Most people are selfish, and that includes how they view themselves. If you find yourself replaying an event over and over again, you need to learn to let go. We often find it difficult to let go because we wish we could have changed things. But the fact is, those events have already taken place and are preventing us from living a full life in the present. Letting go is one of the many things that he emphasizes to his students that will help them unblock clogged chakras and begin living a refreshed life again. Next, we have failure. You can probably see a common thread running through the situations that are most likely to cause the pain. It's no surprise then that failure is one of the main situations that cause this kind of harm. We can often feel worthless and useless after failing at a task or a relationship. However, if we continue to live in the mindset of failure, we start to live in the past, causing our chakras to spin out of balance and create physical manifestations of our hurt. By talking to someone else, you may also help to get the perspective you need so that you can look for a silver lining in the experience of failure. Next, we have loneliness or solitude. The longer you go without relaying, relating closely to others, the more difficult it becomes to reestablish contact with new people or even get back in touch with the old friends you've drifted away from. This may cause us to believe that no one cares about us, but who is to know that you're hurting if you never share that with anyone? If you're convinced that no one could ever love or care about you as a result of your emotional pain or rejection or neglect, he has a method that he calls the replace to repair method. You are capable of love and being loved. Thinking positive thoughts to yourself can help with this process. Another great way to combat loneliness is to adopt a pet that you can nurture and grow. Pets are relatively inexpensive, but may provide the support and listening that you need to open yourself up again and begin living a clearer, happier life. Millions of people are affected by the Para-X bug. I realize that it is something that will stay with me for the rest of my life and long into the afterlife as well. If you have the Para-X bug... There is hope. With a nightly visit to the Parex website and intensive past life regression therapy, I can control it. Even with the Parex bug, I can still lead an active life of radio show hosting, paranormal investigating, evidence checking, attending conferences, book writing, keeping up with the latest technology, and still keep my 40 hour a week day job. If you think that you have the Parex bug or know someone who might, Visit para-x.com and remember, you are not alone. I am not alone. I. 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 I am not alone. The Para-X bug may cause the urge to chase shadow people, visit exotic haunted locations, adopt a pug wedgie, or spend all of your time trying to figure out the laws and principles of paranormal investigation. Listening to Para-X may increase these effects. Sudden visions of full-body apparitions or feeling the covers being pulled off you in the middle of the night by unseen hands may also be signs of exposure to the Para-X bug. The use of Para-X may be habit-forming and an overwhelming desire to provoke spirits may be a serious side effect. If these symptoms last more than four hours, you should quickly consult a trusted witch and have her cast a What the hell are you thinking spell on you. If symptoms persist, please contact the Para-X Radio Network Homeland Security Team for further instructions. The Para-X bug may cause urges for late night speaking with spirits and ghosts. Listening to Para-X may increase these effects. Overwhelming desire to try provoking a spirit may be a serious side effect. Those with Para-X bug effects lasting more than four hours should consult Para-X or see a professional. Sudden outbursts at the mention of orbs may be a sign of exposure to the Para-X bug. Use of Para-X may be habit forming. Use caution when engaging in Para-X chat. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. Hello again. In my last segment, I discussed 
the six most common sources of emotional damage. So now I want to go on talking about emotional trauma. Again, this is off of ReikiInfiniteHealer.com. And the gentleman that runs this is Dave Nelson. He's a Reiki master. And he goes on to talk about how, in his last blog, that he wrote about the six situations. And he received a lot of feedback. So he expanded further on this. So what is emotional and psychological trauma? Emotional and psychological trauma is the result of extraordinarily stressful events that shatter your sense of security, making you feel helpless in a dangerous world. This varies differently from regular stress, which may be temporary. Trauma causes or creates a lifelong pain. The more frightened and helpless you feel, the more likely you are to be traumatized. I've gone over the six most common events that cause emotional pain in my previous article, but to explain this further, it could also be caused by accidents, serious injuries, a negative environment, natural disasters, sudden attack, surgery, death, and so many more things. Chances are that you know someone who has experienced this kind of event before. The repercussions of trauma are many, everything from lasting physical pain and paralysis to emotional detachment. Since traumatic events are all experiences subjectively, there is no right or wrong way to think or respond about a situation. Judging one's own or another's experience may cause more suffering to endure rather than heal. But there are ways to heal from trauma. Whether or not a traumatic event involves death, survivors must cope with the loss, at least temporarily, of their sense of safety. The natural reaction to this loss is grief. Like people who have lost a loved one, trauma survivors go through a grieving process. And before you begin trying to repair the damage of trauma, make sure that you give it enough time to pass. If you turn to others during this time, you will find a support group to hold you stable as you you, your energy and pain slowly dissipate. Trauma disrupts your body's natural equilibrium, freezing you in a state of hyperarousal and fear. In essence, your nervous system gets stuck. As well as burning off adrenaline and releasing endorphins, exercise and movement can actually help your nervous system become unstuck. Try to exercise for at least 10 minutes a day. Whether it's just taking a walk or at the gym does not matter. 30 minutes is preferential but since trauma can be excruciatingly tough to overcome, 10 minutes is a good starting point. Exercise that is rhythmic and engages both your arms and legs, such as walking, running, swimming, basketball, or even dancing, works best. Instead of focusing on your thoughts or distracting yourself while you exercise, really focus on your body and how it feels as you move. Notice the sensation of your feet hitting the ground, for example, or the rhythm of your breathing or the feeling of wind on your skin as you run or walk. However, be sure to start light and progress towards making heavier exercise. Starting too heavy can also throw your body off balance. Seek the comfort of others. Isolation will only make things worse. Connecting to others face-to-face -face will help you heal, so make an effort to maintain your relationships and avoid spending too much time alone. You don't have to talk about the trauma. Connecting with others doesn't have to mean talking about your pain. Instead, talk about other things and direct your attention to the other areas of life. The main takeaway here is that comfort comes from feeling engaged and accepted by others. Become aware. Many things have been written about Reiki breathing er, techniques, and he has seen how dramatically one's life can change through mindful and conscious breathing. No matter how agitated, anxious, or out of control you feel, it's important to know that you can change your arousal system and calm yourself. Not only will this help relieve your anxiety, but it will also engender a greater sense of control. Remind yourself of this as you or someone you are treating or caring for moves through the trauma. Also be aware of other things that are calming. Each and every person's chakra and energetic field responds differently to different inputs. For example, does a specific sight, smell, or taste quickly calm your nerves? Or maybe petting an animal or listening to music works to quickly soothe you. Everyone responds to sensory input a little differently, so experiment to find what works best for you. Rest and eat well. Someone who has experienced trauma may have trouble doing this, but it is crucial to move through the pain. You must get plenty of sleep. 
After a traumatic experience, worry or fear may disturb your sleep patterns, but a lack of quality sleep can exasperate your trauma symptoms and make it harder to maintain your emotional balance. Go to sleep and get up at the same time each day. Aim for seven to nine hours of sleep each night. Sleeping any less than the seven to nine hours after a traumatic event can cause symptoms to worsen as the energy depleted is not fully being restored. Oops, hold on. I'm sorry, guys. So he has a test here. If I can get back to where it was. Um, hold on just a second. He has on this page... A Reiki Emotional and Mental Balance Test. So I, you can go to the page, obviously, yourself and read through all of this and have get the test and just download it with your email. If you'd rather not do that, I have it downloaded and I can send it to you. Just send me your request at michelle.deadzone at gmail.com. That's M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E dot deadzone at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Good evening. I am Sammy Terry, and you're listening to the Dead Zone. <laughs> Your source for everything paranormal, para X. Now, I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen.
all radio stations in town were palm trees, we'd be the one with the biggest coconuts. Now. Here are the one, the only Dead Zone. Okay, let's give Joseph a call. Hello? Hello? Hello, Joseph. Hi, Lee. Hi, yes, how yeah, are you, sir? This is Joe. All right, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Doing fine, okay. Like I said, um, we're going to have like an eight-second delay with the audio. I apologize for that. Uh, Joseph Stewart, author of Demons, A Secular Look. You can find that on Amazon. What uh, other than yes. the, other than the fact that uh, it's basically uh, it documents your personal journey and others into the world of demons, is that correct? Yes, it's uh, my personal journey. What learning about demons and helping some folks out, and uh, um, I wrote the book uh, to make people aware of it. Kind of an update from about 500 years of what we what little we do know about demons. Right. So I brought it more into the modern world. Okay. Well, can you kill, uh, fill us in on, uh, just for, give us an example, if you would. Well, we have an organization right now called Society of Demonologists, and uh, what we do, we have people that uh, feel that they have demonic possession or oppression taking place, and they will contact us, and then we will investigate to see if that's the case, and if it is, then we will do a process that will what I call binding the demon. It's not the same as a exorcism like you see on TV. It's a little bit right. different. Right. It's more like a, the old genie in the bottle kind of thing where you can, <laughs> right. as long as you know the name of the demon, you can uh, basically pretty much do whatever you need with them or kin with them, and that's what uh, that's what we do. Right. Now, isn't there... So I've been actively doing this since about 2016. Pardon? Uh, is, isn't there... Is, I, I've heard something about that. I, I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I may be... But, I mean, that is one of the ways to get rid of, of a demon is if you know its name. And I've heard something like that. It's, I'm not it's sure. the only way you can get rid of them. Okay. But, but yeah. you, you have to it's find the out their Once name. you know their name, you have total control over them. Okay. So how do, how do you go about finding out their name? Um, well, sometimes it's a matter of me just being in the environment because I get attacked by them and stuff. And it just being near them, being touched by them, sometimes the names will come to me. But... Mainly, um, I use psychics, and, and my wife, Dorinda, is uh, very well trained to tune into the demonic. She can hear them. She can see them. Right. And so she can uh, pick up their names, and that's where we start from is using that, and then we just keep doing it until we get rid of everything that's there. Okay. And then, of course, you would do a cleansing and, and that kind of thing. So, so the, the uh, church itself is not involved at all, the Catholic church? No, no. No, the church is not. The churches usually won't do uh, exorcisms. It's a very long political process, and uh, right. many, many people that are clients are uh, Catholics. Right. So they, they just skip, you know, skip the red tape and go directly to you, All right? More or less. Well, no, they try going through the church, but the church basically uh, won't do anything. Okay. He's putting them off, or right. So they just yeah. come to you. Well, yeah. I mean, awesome. That's you know, that's great. And you've been doing that for uh, eleven years. Yeah, I started uh, with the demonic part about two thousand nine. Yeah. But I didn't start actually binding them till two thousand sixteen. Right. What, if you don't mind me asking, what what what's involved in binding? I mean, I've in seen, binding? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, you know, I I I've heard of witches casting a binding spell on someone. Is you know, but I assume it's nothing like that, like what I'm talking about. No, no. It's basically if you know their name, you can bind them. I bind them to an inan inanimate object. It's kind of like the genie in the bottle concept, right? Where they trap the, this evil spirit in in a bottle, then it can't escape. Right. It's the same kind of thing. Okay. So once it's bound into the bottle, it's basically imprisoned, and so it doesn't come back because it's trapped in that whatever you use to bind it in. You could use anything that you want. Okay, so it would be kind of like a, a Dybbuk box, I guess, if I'm thinking of it right. What was that? Kind of, kind, of, kind of reminds me of a Dybbuk box. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, very much along those lines. Okay. So what do you do with the individual item once, once, it's, once, the, once it's over, once it's done? Oh, I get rid of them. I take them places where nobody ever find them, and I bury them, and or I'll dump them out into like you know the Great Lakes or other places where nobody will get to them. Right. 
and I make them where they're in, inert, so even if you did find one right. and dug one up, you wouldn't be able to do anything with it. Okay. So you know, it's just like it's in a coma. It's like to, it's like it's totally asleep, not even aware you're there. Right. So even if someone was to open the box or whatever whatever the case may be, then there's there's no danger. That's correct. Okay. So you've been doing that for 11 years, but you've been a ghost hunter and a UFO investigator associated with APRO and, and MUFON for 50 years, over 50 years. Yeah, I go way back with that. Go yeah. way back with that. I served yeah. as an officer in both those organizations, field investigators, all that stuff, yeah. Right. Well, let me ask you, what was uh, what was one of your most intriguing, let's, let's just go with cryptids right now, What was your, what was your most intriguing investigation with, uh, say, APRO? Uh, let's see, APRO, um, that would have been just investigations, it was more, there wasn't much, and nobody knew anything about deductions back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was uh, Barney Betty Hill then, but it was pretty much, uh, uh, I was doing sightings in the Lansing area of uh, uh, triangular-shaped crafts right. uh, in the late uh, 60s. Uh, that was pretty interesting. Now, that was around, uh, like, kind of not really, but kind of coincides with uh, Project Blue Book, that time frame, right? Yeah, Blue Book uh, closed up in 69. Uh, I knew Dr. Heineck. I worked with him off and on. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Who is uh, the, uh, the consultant for Blue Book, yeah. And so, yeah, they uh, they uh, shut the door on that in 1969. Right. So and and you, that was, you picked up yeah, from there. It, it was two years after that that I got into uh, MUFON. I think it was in 76. Six, I believe. Right. Have you ever actually seen anything with your own two eyes, or it's been like an iffy thing? Like it will. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's yeah. more than more yeah, than just things. Yeah, more than just a couple of lights in the sky. That could be anything, right? I mean, actually seen something. If if so, yeah. Uh, tell us about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, we were working a case over, I don't know if you know, or you're in Indiana, so this was up in uh, Bancroft, Michigan. Okay. And uh, there was a family that was having a lot of UFO activity. Okay. And so uh, there were several of us that witnessed a few of these uh, objects, kind of like a triangular-shaped object, uh, one that looked like a football, and this was during the daytime, too. And one that kind of looked like a, <laughs> kind of reminds you of an ice cream comb. So we actually had visual on all these things. Really? During the daytime. Wow. I, yeah. I, 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 I don't suppose... It went on for about... I don't suppose anyone has a presence of mind to have a camera, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, there was uh, pictures that were taken, uh, 35 millimeter. Right. Um, they're with uh, MUFON, so I'm not... They're being a file somewhere. Oh, okay. I would assume. Because okay. that, that at that time, we were an investigative arm of KUFOS, which was Heineck's group. It was a group of scientists that looked at the data that was brought in by MUFON. So right. it's that information somewhere there. So what was, you say you worked with him, what what were, what were was his thoughts on the uh, the fact that they closed the Blue Book project? Why did they do that? Why would they say, oh, well, there's, there's nothing more to find out here, so just drop it? Well, his job, really, I mean, later on he found out his job was just to debunk everything. And uh, he told me that when he was trying, he said the best reports he had were from military pilots. Right. And he said when I went to get some of the files out of our records, yeah. of our filing system, they were all gone. They, were they had gone. all been removed. Right. And that's when he knew that there was a higher level that he was not privy to, and his job was just the, the crap or things so they could tell people like, oh, you're seeing weather balloons, you know, it's a it's a shooting star, it's this, it's that, right. and that's basically what they wanted. And it was just and so the Air Force would just say, well, it's not a threat to us. They didn't say they didn't exist. They just said it's not a threat to us, the national security, and then they just closed the books on it. We're not investigating it anymore. Yeah. Which is a lie because they did continue on. Right, right. Huh. What, do you, what, uh, what are your thoughts on the I correlation? I think he became a believer. He wasn't a believer. He wasn't a believer. But what he are is my now. thoughts on what? No, no, he wasn't a believer when he went in. He was an astro. Yeah, he was an astrophysicist, and he went in, and then after he'd been in it for a while, then he. he knew that it was it was for real right okay what i was going to say was what, what are your thoughts on the correlation between uh say for example bigfoot and ufos or, or do you think there is any um there's some that do believe that um 
I've been a cryptozoologist for a lot of years. I do a lot of Bigfoot research. Right. And uh, my second book is actually on Bigfoot. And I, I've never come across anything that ties them together. I mean, there are those that do believe it, and there are those that have written books on it. Right. Um, but uh, I haven't seen any correlation. Right. I, I, you know, I've heard all the stories. We've had people on here talking about that, and I can't. I don't. It doesn't make any sense to me. That yeah, well, I've ex- never witnessed it. I've never... Right. These ex- extraterrestrials with, uh, obviously, far advanced beyond what we are, why, why would they have this, basically, ape humanoid <laughs> running around with them? I, I don't get it. I, you know, I, yeah, I don't buy into that at all. Yeah, I, have, <laughs> yeah, I don't have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, so you did mention the... A second book? Are you in the process of writing that, or is it already out? Uh, I'm in the process of writing it. I'm on the second draft right now, so hopefully it will go to the publisher by the end of the year. Okay, that's cool. Have you got a title yet, working title? It's 50 Years of Sasquatch. Okay. Any personal experiences with that? In 50 years, you got to have something, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> First one I ever saw was 1968 in LP, and then when I was deer hunting back in October. Really? Very first one I ever saw. Really? And, and I had uh, no idea what I was looking at. And did it see you? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, peeking around the tree. Yeah. And I was I thought it was a deer. I thought this big buck I've been waiting for was coming out, and all of a sudden it just I saw this ape-like thing looking around the tree, and I was like, what the <laughs> hell is that? Right. It wasn't a bear, and I had no idea. <laughs> right. So you didn't, yeah. So that was my first experience, and and it was just, it was, it was. That was in '68, '67 is when I believe the Patterson, yeah, films took place. Something like yeah. But I didn't see that till that following summer because it came out in Argosy magazine, and that's when I said, "Oh my God, that's what I saw." I, you saw. I had no idea what it was. We never heard of anything like that. Oh, okay. oh, so you, yeah, okay. What? Well, that was a oh my God moment, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it just wandered away. Yes, it, it was. It, it kind of peeked at you and, and uh, just walked away, ignored you? I don't know. I never saw it. I, no, I never saw it leave. It just it was peeking, and it would go back behind the tree, and then I, I never saw it again. So I don't know how, it, whether it moved in, okay. in line with the tree and me and walked away in that. I have no idea. Okay. I, mean, I obviously was not going to walk up and find out. Right. I mean, that's what, pretty, what if, I mean, what if you did? I at least eight foot tall. Yeah. Well, what if you did though? What that'd be? Ooh, yeah. That'd be something. Wow. Oh man, I'm sure. I'm sure you've interviewed people that have uh, had experiences too, right? Is that gonna be, that'll, that'll be part of your book too, right? Yeah. See, that kind of makes it hard though. Um, going off someone else's story, you know, it's kind of hard to to get your head around and put your faith into it. And I mean, you you, you for yourself. You were there, you know, it was your experience and your experience alone, but if you're going to put someone else's story in your book, you kind of got to be, you know, pretty sure that they're not full of it. Yeah, most of this, yeah, yeah, and I don't do that. My, everything that's in the book is all my stuff, the things I experienced. Okay. So, it's not, I'm not relaying other people's experiences. I'm, this is about my stuff, my experiences, uh, I experiment in the field with them, that kind of stuff, finding out as much as I can about them. Right. Well, I was just going by that because uh, I did read uh, in the paragraph there the demons and the sec- a secular look. It says something about that uh, you document documents your personal experiences as well as other as well as I can't speak as well as others. So I didn't know if that was going to be in the book or you know. Oh, what I'm referencing there is, uh, um, you know, like I, a lot of the research I did was, you know. Five six hundred years old. Some of the old documents oh, okay, okay. involving demons and that, right. and I was able to reference that. And like, say, I'm doing a demon case in Detroit, and I say, well, I wonder if what they said is true. And then I would be able to test it in the field and find out, yeah, it is true. It actually does what they said it does. So that kind of stuff. That's what I was referring to. I see. I get you. I understand now. Okay. When you first started, yeah, everything out- that's in that book, it's all it's all my experience. First, yeah, it's uh, right. So my direct experience. All right, going going back Every to uh, going back to a ghost hunting. Um, when you started, that was way way before all the little gadgets and, and toys came out, right? So back then, right, oh, reel to reel tape recorders, yeah. uh, thirty five millimeter cameras, right. 
uh, yeah, it was way different. Nobody even knew what EVPs were. <laughs> right, you know? right. Uh, and there was no software or anything like that. Right. Uh, so well, what was your go-to piece of equipment back then? I mean, it really was only two or three to choose from. Uh, notebook, pad, uh, tape recorder, and camera. And camera. That was about it. Right. And personal. And your yourself. A lot of people used to use psychics. I don't know if you're familiar with Hans Holzer. I'm not sure. But it was more or less along his lines. Okay. Yeah, yeah he was a ghost hunter back in the 60s. And, uh, yeah, he was on a lot of TV shows. He's wrote, oh my God, about 200 bucks. Oh, really? Oh. And... Uh, I guess I should yeah, know him then. Yeah, he's one of the, yeah, he's one of the, yeah, there's a thing called the um, Holzer Files that used to be on television. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. And on Travel Channel and that, yeah, that's Hans Holzer, that's his work. Oh, okay. That they're going back and reinvestigating. I see. With Dave Schrader. Right, that's, that's yeah, okay, now, that's where I heard it from, yeah. Okay, so I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Well, how about that? So he's the one that kind of got me into it. Right. I read his books way back in the day. And you're still still going strong. How's it? Uh, how's the? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, I belong to a group in Detroit, but uh, I, I, they call me in once in a while. My specialty was EVP work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I when, when we do our demon stuff, we're at people's homes and stuff. We run into ghosts as well. And right. We try to help out with that, but my main focus is on the demonic. But yeah, I, we still do the ghost stuff. We still run into it. Right. Well, that would make sense. I mean, because it could be the demon acting like it's. Something yeah, a lot else. of times people are dealing with demons. That, yeah, they, yeah, they don't realize exactly. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, fifty years. Fifty years, ghost hunter. Eleven years. Yeah. A demon Long hunter. Time. My gosh. And just now, you're doing your second book. That's amazing. <laughs> and that book can be yeah. found on Amazon. That's by the way. basically what I'm doing. I'm just writing the books of all the things I've researched over the years. That's basically what I'm doing. Very cool. Now, is Amazon the only place that, that uh, that's available right now? No, it's pretty much, you can get it at uh, pretty much anywhere. You know, uh, Barnes & Noble carries it, okay. uh, Target carries it, Walmart carries it. Oh, uh, okay. Amazon, and then it's all bookstores all over the world. It's international. It's all over the world. All right. Oh, that's awesome. Well, there you go, guys. That should be easy to find then. Joseph Stewart. Oh, yeah. Demons, a secular look. Right. Well, we're going to run out of time here. Uh, Joseph, I appreciate you coming on, and I'm so sorry about the software. I wish we could have got it to work so we can have Dorinda on as well. But uh, at any rate, we do appreciate you, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back, and we can talk about the new book too, the upcoming book. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. And we will, we will air this episode. We'll air next Sunday. So in case you wanted to tune in, Okay. I'll send you a link. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Talk to you soon. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. This is Sandy Johnson, and you're listening to The Dead Zone. Hey, this is Lee. If you missed tonight's show or any other show, you can always check them out in the archives on the Para-X Radio Network, or you can go to our website and click on any of your favorite apps. I saw your face in the spirit glass, framed by the black flames of your past. I see the torture in your eyes.
in the blood of everyone. If you've enjoyed this episode, share it with your friends. This is the Dead Zone Paranormal Radio Show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.